Okay, welcome to our uh, seminar today and to the first talk, uh, to which we are very happy to welcome uh, Nicola Gili from CISA, and he will speak about differentiating in a non-differentiable environment. Please. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, so first of all, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, uh, so so um, I'm afraid that in some sense the European audience of this talk will not hear uh, really anything particularly new. Um, hopefully, uh, this will not be the case uh, for the you know non-European audience, and um, so I apologize to those of you who will you know uh, get a bit sleepy during my talk. But in some sense, I guess one of the reasons for me being here is uh, in some sense to advertise uh, some of the uh, things that happened around uh, uh, Trieste, Pisa, Bonn, uh, and Europe in general in about calculus in on uh, in Osmos setting. Um, so little or actually almost no of the latest results, but on the other hand, I will try to, in some sense, uh, uh, outline an overall strategy in some sense. Uh, so let's see what this is about. Um, I will start with a generic introduction, you know, to what this talk is about. Then I will speak about the possibility of doing, uh, uh, or in which sense we can perform first order calculus on general metric measure spaces. Uh, I don't think we can go much beyond first order calculus on general metric measure spaces. In some sense, for the same reasons, we should not expect to have, uh, you know, higher differential calculus on a manifold that is only, say, C1. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if some curvature, some second order bound, so a curvature bound is in place on the on a space, then perhaps a more sophisticated calculus is possible. This is true both in the context of Alexander spaces. And in the context of RCD spaces, and I will speak about about RCD spaces. Um, also, I will really just stick to the positive definite case in some sense. So distances and measures on, on spaces. So the classical in some sense setting of Gromov triples. Of course, we have learning uh, of exciting developments in the setting of uh, non-smooth Lorentzian geometry, uh, where basically none of what I'm going to, to say today is currently available. And I think it would be an interesting challenge to understand, uh, and uh, you know, both mathematically and you know, in terms of application, to understand if and up to what extent any of what I'm going to say today, uh, you know, has a, an analog in the setting of uh, Lorentzian length spaces, TCD spaces, and all this business we heard a lot about uh, in this um, uh, in this last conference a couple of weeks ago. All right, so uh, let me start. So of course. The, Smoothness is something that we perfectly understand when we speak about functions from R to R. That's where we learn, you know, the concept of derivative at first. And then, of course, by acting, uh, you know, by working component-wise, and uh, and we can go from R D to R K, let's say, and then by playing with charts, we know perfectly what it is. What it is a smooth map between Riemannian manifolds, within actually differentiable manifolds, no Riemannian condition. All right. Now we are going to move. About you know about working uh, in a non-smooth setting where where no a priori smoothness is given. So in the manifold setting smoothness is read through charts, but if you have no charts, you know you have a priori no smoothness of any sort. Okay, and uh, I'm going to discuss a few possible definitions. I mean, if, I mean, actually quite a few, but all of them have the characteristic of being intrinsic. So so they are not definitions that come after a certain sort of charts have been built in the metric measure setting. Now there is nothing wrong in building charts and making calculus, you know, tight or relate to charts, whether it is the original charts that's built by Chiger or the more recent uh, beautiful construction by Erickson, Bicke, Soltanis, just to make an example. Uh, but in some sense, uh, uh, in any case, uh, if you so it's a, it's it's certainly not a bad idea if you can to try to develop an intrinsic calculus, because intrinsic calculus, so the regularity of the computations that you can that you can do that you can perform is only related in some sense to the actual smoothness of the, of the space and not on the smoothness of the charts that you build in some sense, right? If you rely on charts, then you cannot go beyond which sort of regularity you have on those charts. Well, if you do, if you go intrinsic, well, then, then, okay. Uh, and as I mentioned on arbitrary metric measure space, you know, only a quotation marks, because that's already quite interesting. I would say first order calculus can be developed, or at least I will consider just that. 
and then as this basis it will go we will go to second order functions now just to put things into into context when we speak about non smoothness i mean we can speak you know a, a function as a, a domain and the codomain and either one of these can be non smooth and typically in applications the non smoother of one and the non smoother of the other are typically in the two independent difficulties sort of it's not really true i mean in particular if you have seen the series of lectures of by kleiner i guess the in September, first or second week of September, you, you see that sometimes, in some sense, if you have the same sort of non smoothness on both source on, and target, like, um, uh, you know, those coming from uh, sublimanian geometry, in some sense, in, they can occasionally match. And so they have to be dealt at the same time together. But most often, uh, they are two sort of independent difficulties. Um, and uh, in some relevant case not many but at least in few of these uh the 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 lack of smoothness uh, oh, no, this is the, the lack of smoothness uh, in the codomain in some case can be handled by post composition in some sense you can read the regularity of a map uh, with say or at least first order regularity of a map with a metric target by looking at the regularity of post composition with ellipsis maps in some sense the formula that is that i'm referring to say that you have map smooth map between Riemannian manifolds then you can realize with the modulus of the differential of this map by just looking at the supreme of the modulus of differentials of the you know post composition with with one Lipschitz maps and that gives a way in some sense if you can measure the model of the differential you can measure in some sense the first order regularity of a map in a way that is reduced to regularity of real value maps okay not all instances can you know fall in this category in fact my important instances are not but that's a trick that in, in few important cases works okay but I will focus on real value. Okay. So for me, from now on, no smooth sorts are targets. So the smoothest target. Now, another important conceptual distinction that I want to make is that of Lipschitz versus Sobolev. Uh, you know, in the metric setting, there are, if you speak about first order regularity, there is, in some sense, a, a, at least a dichotomy. We, we can discuss how much this is a dichotomy and how much this is more of a uh, how much there is a continuous interpolation between the two, but at least you can speak in on one side about uh, Lipschitz functions and on one side of, of Sobolev functions. And the way to treat uh, these kind of structures is a bit different. Both are relevant. In particular, I certainly want to mention the beautiful work by Chigar, uh, seminal work, in fact, where or even Sobolev spaces have been introduced um, in the metric measure setting, at least in the way I will discuss it today. Um, and, and one of the things that she did was to prove that under suitable assumptions on the metric measure structure, typically called doubling and Poincare, um, and the Macker theorem works. Amazing result. I mean, quite unexpected if you think about it. I mean, you can state the Macker theorem and prove the Macker theorem on arbitrary metric measure space. That's uh, amazing. And there's been the source of many development uh, in the fields, including in particular, I mean, Chigar's result is so beautiful that a definition came out of his theorem that of Lipschitz differentiability spaces, whose study is still continues as of today with interesting results uh, yeah. in terms of the of the of their structure. I'm thinking in particular at the recent achievements by Bate. Now, Sobolev, on the other hand, Sobolev is something that is more related in some sense to integration by parts. So the concept of integration by parts and the concept of Sobolev functions are really, you know, sort of brother and sister. And uh, and in some sense, uh, and you know, uh, when you perform, when you when you when you handle something as smooth, typically integrating by parts is a good idea, uh, as we have learned uh, in basic distribution theory in the Euclidean setting, and uh, and uh, so it's something that you know, deserves a little bit of attention. And I will and I will and I will discuss this. That is, um, uh, we focus on the sober regularity. Okay, and in some sense, we will see that on RCD space, this allows for a natural second order theory. In that sense, what I'm, the first of the theory that, that I'm going to discuss is very much tailored to the development in the RCD setting. Of course, you can do second order theory even without speaking about Sobolev functions. You, if you have, in, if you live in the Alexandro setting, you can certainly be more than content to work with uh, uh, convex and semi-convex functions, um, which is a sort of a different business. All right. Um, okay. So first of the calculus on general metric measure spaces. Now those that are coming to my lectures. We'll see something extremely familiar that I discussed, uh, I think, two days ago. Um, and uh, for those who haven't and don't know about this, it's perhaps, uh, you know, I guess what I should, first of all, emphasize is that, so if we start from a, you know, metric measure space, as, as it is written on the slide, so complete and separable in the metric sense, and the Borel measure 
finite on balls, uh, uh, you know, in terms of measure perspective. Uh, so even though a priori we have no way of integrating by parts, just an osmo structure, still it is possible to give a meaning to the concept of sobolet function. And a first observation in this direction, which I guess goes back to the original work of Iwash, is that if I if I say if I have a, a function which is in L two, and I want to know whether it is W one whether it is in W one two or not, well then I don't have to uh, to know who is this distributional differential. I could be content by knowing who is the modulus of the distributional differential. Okay, so and basically a number rather than a vector, and that has more chances to have a definition in the, in the metric category. That's a heuristic. Now, in practice, what do we do? Well, we define, say, for an arbitrary real value function on X, we can define what is called the local Lipschitz constant. For students uh, of my Clark lectures, it's a little bit different of the thing that I've defined in my course, but a posteriori equivalent. I mean, the construction that it provides is equivalent. So you should not get bored bothered by the fact that I, this is different from what you've seen in the blackboard. So this uh, limb soup of this difference quotient uh, it, it gives a measure of how much the, the function is oscillating at the point x. Of course, if f is a smooth function on Rd, that is really the modulus of the differential. Right? Then at, as a first approximation, we can define the achiever energy by just integrating the square of this quantity. And, uh, and, uh, and if we want to produce you know, the analog of the Dirichlet energy, in uh, you know in this metric measure setting, we should not be content with this. We should take the L two semi continuous relaxation of the of this object. Okay, and why we should this so well? Because even on R D, this is not a Dirichlet energy, right? A Sobolev function is typically everywhere discontinuous, and and uh, so this is actually plus, plus infinity, uh, you know, at every point. And in fact, this also this quantity is not invariant under modifications of the function almost everywhere so it is bad in some sense from the perspective of, of you know sobre function should be you know a subset of border functions up to uh, you know equality almost everywhere so so a couple of indications that that is not a good concept so the lower decimal continuous relaxation what does it mean it means that if i want to define the energy of a function i should pick all the sequences of functions in this case it's enough to take a sequence of Lipschitz functions converging to f in l2 and among, for each of these sequences, I, I will look to the limit of this approximated energy, if you wish, and then I take the inf among all the possible sequences. Okay. If you play this game on RD, you get the Dirich energy. Okay. You can play the same game on an arbitrary metric measure space. So, of course, as usual, what we do in generalizing things, we turn a theorem into a definition. Huh? So the theorem would be on RD, this is the Dirich energy into the definition, this is our Dirich energy. Okay. Why I'm not calling Dirich energy? Well, for two reasons. The first is that uh, this is not a this is not a Dirichlet form in general. If you know what the Dirichlet form is, in particular, this does not satisfy the parallelogram rule. Okay, so if I call the Dirichlet energy, there's a risk of, of confusion. And Chigger energy is because you know Chigger has been the first to uh, you know adopt this uh, relaxation approach to sobre functions. So he was relaxing a different quantity, but in the end, uh, his function is the same as this, and I think this is easier to do. All right. Uh, now, now that we have an energy, okay, that's then we have a, we have our sovereign space. So W12 is simply the space of functions in L2 with finite energy. That's nothing more natural than this. And it comes with the natural norm, okay, which is the just the L2 norm plus this uh, chigger energy. Um, you know, square root of sum of this. It is trivial to check that this is a Banach space. Trivial. The, the, where the completeness comes from the lower semi-continuity of the chigger energy, crucially. Okay. Is not always an, an Hilbert space, uh, and uh, and that has to do with okay. So 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 uh, already, if you play this game on RD with the norm, what you what you come out with is is a Banach space and not an Hilbert. Okay, so there's nothing to do with the lack of smoothness of the metric measure space. It has to do with the geometry of it. Okay. Now, an important result by Chigar is that whenever you have a Sobolev function and an optimal sequence in the definition of the Chigar energy, the sequence of Lipschitz functions. Then the sequence of local ellipses constants always converge strongly in L2 to a function, uh, which I will denote this way, and uh, is called the, the minimal weak upper gradient. And this limit is independent on the particular uh, uh, sequence, and you know provides, in some sense, a pointwise, uh, you know, uh, in, provides a pointwise version of the sugar energy. You integrate the square of this guy, and you get the sugar energy. And of course, I'm denoting it in this way. Because uh, um, uh, uh, you know, in the smooth setting, that would be the modulus of the distributional of the distributional differential. Even though at this stage, 
there is no distributional differential. So the, the, in sense, the notation is uh, uh, cheating in some sense, but in a good way. In some sense, it wants to be reminiscent of what happens of what happens in the smooth cutting. All right, now I want to convince you that this guy really has uh, deserves uh, uh, the uh, notation that I chose. So I want to you know, convince you that these, that these uh, satisfy the calculus rule that you would expect from a modulus of distributional differential. And here it is. So uh, first of all, we have a lower semi-continuity uh, that is, uh, you know, the, in some sense, the analog for this minimal weak upper gradients of the lower semi-continuity of the Chigar energy. So if you have a sequence of Sobolev functions that is converging on L2 on one side, and their minimal weak upper gradients are converging in L2 to a limit function G, possibly weak in both cases, well, then the limit function is Sobolev and its minimal weak upper gradient is bounded from above by that function capital G, as it would be in the, in the smooth category. Then you have a natural subadditivity. Of course, you don't have linearity because that guy is a modulus, so, so that, that, that's the best you can hope. Uh, you, have, you have a chain rule in a natural way. You have a Leibniz rule, again, with an inequality. That's the best you can get. And let me underline, you have this locality property that is going to be crucial in a couple of slides uh, that tells that if you have two subtle functions and they agree on a certain Borel set, then their minimal weak upper gradients also agree on, the, on, on that set, almost set. Okay? This is non-trivial and I think extremely interesting, even on RD, okay? It would be trivial if you were speaking about open sets because in some sense uh, you integrate by parts with functions in support on the given open set, you cannot distinguish F and G, but this is true even, even if the set is just Borel, all right? Okay, uh, so far so good. So we have a first order calculus, of course the choice P equal to uh, plays no role, you know, P strictly between one and infinity, you can, you know, do the same without, without any relevant modification. P equal infinity, few people care. P equal one is actually, uh, you know, delicate. It leads to the theory of BD functions. And this has been pioneered by uh, Miranda, the metric measure setting. Uh, but I will not discuss about BD case. All right. Uh, now, now say that I want, say that I want to, you know, to move forward. And I want to say, look, I'm really, you know, I really, I'm not satisfied. Uh, there's not enough for me uh, working with modules of distributional differential. I really want the differential. So who is the differential of the function? Is there or not? And, and I think there is. And, um, and in order to introduce it, let me first of all, first of all, recall, uh, recall uh, a basic part about measure theory, I guess. Um, um, so let me recall that whenever you have a measure, or say rather on, uh, on a space, um, you can consider the space, so you typically one study the space is LP for P between one and infinity, but there's also a very natural notion of space L0, which basically is the space of uh, uh, functions that are, Borel functions that are finite almost everywhere, basically. Defined up to, um, uh, you know, equi equality almost everywhere. So L0 is because if M is a finite measure, L0 would be the space of functions that F to the power zero uh, is integrable, so F should be finite almost everywhere. Okay? Um, and that, you know, the definition is over there. So it's just the space of Borel maps, you know, Borel functions up to equality almost everywhere. And one interesting thing is that, okay, this is not a Banach space by far. It's not a Banach space, but still there is a natural uh, um, topology, Polish topology on it, which is induced, for instance, by the following distance. Fix your preferred L1 function, H, positive almost surely, and define the distance in this way. So you just integrate the minimum between H and you know the difference, uh, the absolute value of the difference between F and G. Surely this is uh, is uh, finite because H is in a one, so that's at least a finite number. And you can check that it is a distance. You can check that it is a complete and separable distance on L zero. And in fact, and perhaps more interestingly, the topology induced by this distance is independent on the function H. Okay, so that's the intrinsic topology of L zero. And and if I the convergence in L zero is basically local convergence in measure. Okay, so L0 is the space of convergence in measure. Okay. Why am I speaking about this guy? Well, um, um, well, because if I want to speak about, about so the, I guess the basic idea is this, if I want to speak about covector fields uh, or vector fields in a metric measure setting, uh, I should, uh, in, in, well, okay, let me perhaps, uh, let me postpone the heuristic for a second. Let me, let me introduce another definition. So let me model on the space L0, 
I will model another structure, which is the one of L0 of the module. Now, what is the L0 of the module? L0 of the module is a vector space, M, equipped with two additional structures. So the first is a multiplication with a zero function. So M should be a module over the ring L0. Okay. L0 is a ring. You can you, you take the product or linear combinations of functions in a, in a zero, certainly you end up in a zero. So, so it should be a module in a, in a very algebraic sense. And moreover, there should be a, a map which I, that I call pointwise norm that satisfies, you know, uh, the following property should always be non-negative, almost surely, should satisfy a sort of a pointwise triangle inequality, and should be compatible with the product uh, with functions in, in the sense that the pointwise norm of f times v should be the same as the absolute value of f times the pointwise norm of v, almost surely, for any vector v in my vector space and every function f. And what I impose at the topological level is that if I consider this distance, I just, you know, basically take the analog of what was the distance in, um, in uh, L0. But now I tailored with, with two elements of this vector space by using this point to as norm. What I get, what I'm asking to get is a complete distance. Okay. And, and uh, the distance, of course, depends on the function h as before that I used, but the topology that it uses does not. So you have completeness, for instance, with one h, if and only if you have completed, uh, completeness for any other h. Okay. Now, why these L0 spaces and perhaps even more so, why these L0 of the modules? Why do we care? Well, because basically the space, uh, so if you take, so what, are, what, what is the example of, of uh, the driving example of L0 of the module? Well, if you take Riemannian manifold, you take the space of Borel vector fields up to, you know, equality almost everywhere, this is in a very natural way is um, uh, um, uh, an L0 of the module the collection of vector fields okay and more generally the collection of Borel sections of a normed vector bundle on any space regardless of any smooth structure you know one has one has on the under, on the underlying set uh, is uh, an l0 normed module and now the idea which basically an idea that i'm mitigating from I, I got from a paper of weaver is that so in the smooth setting one knows that uh, one knows that um um uh, and in, and in, in many circumstances, one knows that a bundle can be described by either describing its fibers and how they are glued together or by describing in sections. And the regularity of the bundle is then interpreted in terms of regularity of the section that one is considering. And this is true in a very, in a, in a very deep way. There is a, there is a meta theorem by Serence Wall that basically tells you that in many categories, what I just described is in a, you know, uh, uh, you get the equivalence of categories on one side, projective modules uh, over a certain ring and on the other hand on the other side uh, finite uh, uh, you know vector bundles of, over say algebraic manifolds or, so, or, so, or stuff of that like that so basically there is this deep duality uh, that we that we you know and the extrapolate from that duality is simply the, the fact that if I want to know what a bundle is either I should know its fibers or I should know the section and either of the two should be okay and what we were suggested basically is look in this metric measure setting, let's forget, let's forget about you know trying to describe what it is the tangent space at every point or almost every point or cotangent or whatever other you know bundle that you want to describe. Let's just pretend, let's just pretend that any module, okay, was considered a different technically, a different sort of object, but conceptually the same. So let's just think that this any S0 norm module in this sense that I just described in the previous slide is the space of Borel sections of some bundle that is actually not really given. And that actually we don't really care what the, in some sense, the exact fibers at every point or almost every point we imagine. So is it clear what I'm saying, right? So, so I'm thinking, and as zero normal module, as the space of sections of, of some bundle, you know, that, that is not given, but I have the sections, okay? Now in practice, in practice, um, one can extract uh, in many, Important circumstances, an actual bundle from a module. This has been the result of some works done by Di Marino, Lucia Pasqualetto, and more recently, uh, also in some collaboration with myself. But uh, but in that sense, I will not push in this direction. So for me, a module is just a module, and I think of a space of sections. And the relation of this definition with sober calculus is in this theorem that tells that up to unique isomorphism. 
So take an arbitrary metric measure space. Okay. And then up to unique isomorphy, there is a unique couple, L0 t star x d, where, okay, sorry, that uh, where L0 t star x is m is here. L0 t star x is an L0 of the module. And d is a linear map that takes subtle functions and returns element of this, of this module, satisfying two properties. So the first is that whenever we start with the subtle function, we pick d of f. Now we, we have an element of our module. And then we take the pointwise norm of d of f. What we end up with is almost surely the minimal weak upper that we already had before from Chigger's result. First thing. Second thing, if I take all the DS and I take uh, their, uh, their, uh, the uh, at zero linear combinations, what I get is something that is dense in my module. Okay. These two things together already grant existence and uniqueness up to unique isomorphism. So unique isomorphism means that the structure is as rigid as it could be. So if you have, okay, so this should have been a two. So if you have another couple and prime D prime with the same properties, then you should have a unique isomorphism uh, from uh, our module to these other guys such as the trigram for means. So that's a fancy way of saying that the only freedom that you have is changing names to your objects, right? Certainly I could pick any other set in bijection with my guy and, and uh, you know, use this, that bijection to carry over the structure from L0 to the other, to, to the other you know, set of the same cardinality. And what this is telling is that this is the only, the only thing that I could do. Okay, so the structure is extremely rich. Uh, just for you know, technical purposes, let me, let me uh, just call L2 to the star X, the subset of L0 to the star X made of those guys with, uh, with point to norm in L2. Okay, rather than just in L0, in L2. So I, I, I'm putting some integrability requirement. And in a natural way, this space is a Banach space. Okay, when you equip it with the norm, which is the L2 norm of this guy. Okay. All right. Um, okay, now uh, what's a comment that is important to make? Um, so, of course, I, I want to call L0 T star X the cotangent module. The typical element of L0 T star X will be a one form. Okay, defined, I think it is a one form, defined almost everywhere on my space. And D of F, where F sub of F should be the differential of a sub of F function. Now, uh, the two um, properties that, that, I, that I gave over, over there totally characterize the, the differential right? because, because of this existence and uniqueness result. And so, so I should, you know, I should be cautious a little bit because in principle, in principle, this differential might not, might not have the desirable properties that a non-smooth differential typical should have. But in some sense, uh, actually it has all of them. And uh, let me, you know, list the calculus rule for this differential in a way that, you know, resembles the previously presented properties for the weak upper gradient. So first, uh, what previously was a lower semi-continuity here becomes a, a closure condition. And this is very much related, uh, you know, much like the semi-continuity of the Chigger energy implies that uh, W12 is Banach, and sometimes the same sort of principle is there. So, so if you have a sequence of sobre functions, say converging in L2 in such a way that DFN is converging weakly or strongly in L2 T star X in this Banach space to some object that is a one form, okay, then not only I can conclude that this that the function F is sobre. But that this differential is really this limit one form. Okay. What previously was subadditivity, now it's linear. D is linear. Um, we have the chain rule, we have the Leibniz rule, and we have the locality. So, where in each of these cases, the module structure plays a role. So, for instance, uh, look at Leibniz rule. I have two Sobole functions that are also bounded. Their product is also Sobole. And the differential, you know, can be written in this form where the fact that I can, you know, give a meaning to FDG or GDF comes from the model structure and multiplying an object of my module by a function, right? And the same for the chain rule. And in some sense, again, similarly for, for the locality. This means that, you know, if I multiply this function by the characteristic function of the complement of this set, um, uh, no, sorry, by, by uh, the characteristic function of this set, then the result uh, is the same element of the module. Okay. All right. Uh, what else I should say? Ah, okay, um, about a general structure. Um, so, 
we know how to take duals of Banach spaces. We know how to also how to take duals uh, of general um, modules over rings. Uh, if uh, M uh, and in the end, and we know in a sense by imitating those definitions, we can take the dual of a, of a module in, in our sense. Namely, the dual of, of a module M is nothing but the space of all linear and continuous map. Um, actually, I should say L0 linear, L0 linear and continuous map from the module to L0. Okay. This is really the analog. If you, you take any book of algebra, so you open the chapter speaking about modules, a module over a ring A. The dual of a module is just the set of morphisms from M to A, which is exactly what, what I'm doing here, where I'm imposing also some continuity because topology is relevant in this business in some sense. And what one can check uh, is that the dual, in this sense, naturally comes with the structure of a zero norm the module. There is a point to a norm, there is a multiplication by a zero function. So in some sense, once we have the cotangent module, we can take the dual and speak about, you know, and call it the tangent one. And in a way, in a way that can be made precise, and I will make precise during my course. Uh, um, so in a way, the point twice dome that is living in this tangent module in some weak sense, but still uh, relevant, induces the distance, okay? So on, on Riemannian or Friedel manifold, one first start with uh, norms or, or um, scalar product on tangent spaces, and then uses that to compute length of curves and then derive the distance here in some sense, Thing goes backward. So we start from a metric measure structure, sobre functions, module, tangent module, and then in some sense, in some sense, uh, the point wise norm in this tangent, in this tangent space, in some sense, induces the underlying distance. Okay. In some sense, I don't want to be precise because that would require me giving too many definitions, but in a, in a non trivial way. Okay. All right. And this, okay, no, perhaps one last thing. Um, so, so I mentioned that W12 is not always Hilbert. If it is, uh, I shall call this space uh, the metric measure space infinitesimal Hilbertian. And that is not hard to check that this is equivalent to checking whether for an arbitrary couple of elements uh, in, the tan in the cotangent module, or even tangent anyway, this is you know, self dual, this thing, uh, you have the you know, point wise parallelogram rule okay? in a natural way. And now, if that happens, if that happens, you know, when you have a parallelogram rule by polarization, you get a scalar product. Uh, and uh, and then and then of course we can do the same. So for any arbitrary you know, uh, v and w, we can use this formula to define what in fact only, in fact it turns out to be an L zero linear map that of course I will call pointwise scalar product. And uh, and if I play this game with the cotangent module and Sobolev functions, I can naturally give a, a, a definition of Laplacian. So I can say that a function in W one two is a Laplacian. In L2, if there is, you know, the portion of F in L2 satisfying this integration by partial formula. Okay. In this setting, the Laplacian is linear. And of course, you can wonder, wait, I mean, those students of my course can wonder, wait, two days ago you presented as a nonlinear Laplacian, and that was in higher generality. Here I'm sticking to the case of infinitesimal Hilbertian cases, which, okay, if you want by definition, are those spaces where the Laplacian is linear. Okay. All right. So that's all I wanted to, to say about, um, about general metric measure spaces. Now I will, I will discuss uh, a little bit, uh, a couple of things for what concerns RCD spaces. And again, uh, in some sense, much like the presentation in the, um, in the met general metric measure spaces, I will just uh, stick uh, in some sense to giving definitions and few of theorems that are true concerning calculus. And basically what I want, or I'm asking you to believe is that this calculus is actually useful for proving theory. Huh? So much like, much like uh, you, know, uh, you know, any book of Riemannian geometry starts with 10 or 50, depends on the author, uh, pages in describing, uh, you know, how to make computations, what are charts, what, are, what is the tangent space, uh, what is the, say, covariant derivative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and building out all the calculus lemma before actually, you know, using those tools to prove theorems in the Riemannian setting. In some sense, the same program um, uh, uh, can be, uh, performed, I mean, we don't do it about modifications, of course, on RCD spaces. And I'm not certainly saying, I'm not saying that any result on RCD space is based on this sort of calculus. But what I'm just to say is to believe me that if you know this, you are in good shape in, you know, in order to start proving theorems and understanding the structure of RCD spaces. And uh, let me start with the definition of RCD space. Um, and let me cheat a little bit. 
namely, I will adopt the definition that is, you know, closest to what I'm going to say. And this is, in fact, historically, this is a theorem. It's an equivalent theorem. So the original definition did not come in this way. Uh, this is a result uh, uh, that I've been with the Bros and Savaret. Uh, so in answer to this space, is a metric measure space to we'll start with. So all of what I said as of now um, is in place. Satisfying a couple of properties that are, that are extremely relevant, but that I will ignore for the talk of today. So let's forget about one and two. Let's focus on three and four. So the third property is that X is infinite by a Burton in the sense that we just described. So W1 to zero. And four, in a, this bulk inequality holds in the weak sense. Now, all in the weak sense, first of all, let me mention, let me observe that I have defined all the objects that are, that are appearing over here. I defined what is the minimum weak upper gradient. I define differentials. I define scalar polar differentials. I define the Laplacian. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about holes in the weak sense because typically, typically there is not enough regularity in this not smooth set, in this not smooth setting to grant that the, the weak upper gradient that scored is in the domain of the Laplacian as I defined. So this Laplacian should be intended in, in the sense of integration by parts. But let me, you know, um, I've already given too many details over here. And, uh, and let me comment about this book. What is this? Let's look to the, so why, so first of all, in the smooth category, this completely characterizes uh, uh, Riemannian manifolds with uh, rich equivalent greater than K. Okay. So in some sense, given that again, in the smooth setting, this is a characterization. I can use this characterization to speak about lower bound on the rich curvature, even in a setting where I don't have a prior rich curvature. Um, now, let me comment a little bit about, about this, uh, this uh, um, book inequality. So first of all, uh, first of all, uh, what you should know, um, if you, you know, if you ever speak about Ricci curvature, you should know about the uh, book and wise and book identity, which is this identity one that I brought over there. So you take any, any Riemannian manifold and any smooth function, that is true, okay? So basically, basically, if you are on RD, this difference is the Hilbert spin norm of the action, okay? If you are on a Riemannian manifold, I mean, in, in making this computation, you sh in some sense you need to invert uh, derivatives, and and because of this, uh, and because of these, uh, curvature terms appear, and what appears is really rich. Okay. So this is an identity that works on any manifold. Now, if the rich curvature is bounded from below by k, well, then uh, certainly on the right hand side I can drop the positive Hessian term or non-negative, and bounce from below the rich curvature and get this. So trivially, one implies two. More interestingly, given that on this right hand side, um, the Hessian and the Ricci, they act at different scales. If you have two for F, well, implies, well, I guess here I wrote implies one. What I meant to say, what I meant to say is that two implies the validity of two with the Hessian squared on the right hand side. I don't know if this makes any sense to you. What I want to say is this. So if you, if you read one and two together, what you conclude is that on your Riemannian manifold with a lower Ricci bound, you have the following inequality. The Hessian of F, Hilbert-Schmidt norm squared plus the Ricci curvature in the direction grad F grad F. This is always greater or equal than K times, you know, the differential of F squared, right? Now, what I, what, I'm, what I want to let you observe is that if this is true for any F, what it must be true is that the rich is greater than K. The validity of this cannot come from the Hessian term. And why I can say so? Well, because for any, if you give me a point, a tangent vector at that point, and a symmetric matrix, I can always find in the Riemannian manifold the smooth function that in that point has the derivative that you gave and the Hessian that you gave. Okay. In particular, for any point and tangent vector, there is a function that has that gradient as a vector and zero Hessian. Pick that function over there. The Hessian gives no contribution, and the rich in that vector direction is bounded from below by k times vector. You see what I mean? So they act, so the Hessian and, uh, and the rich, they act on different scales in this sense. One speaks about first derivatives and one about second derivatives. All right? So that's interesting. Because basically, it is telling that this inequality 
gets self-improved. If you know this for any function f, you know that on the right hand side you can add a positive term or a negative term, which is the Hessian square. Of course, this in the smooth setting, I cannot pick points, tangent vectors, and Hessians and prove. I mean, I don't have the proficiency in the non smooth setting of doing this sort of calculus. However, however, an important observation that's, this, that's been made basically by Bakri in the 90s and then uh, uh, reutilized by Savarestrum and myself is that the same kind of, you know, this self improvement is in fact something that, you know, can be, you know, managed even in, in the non smooth category of RCD spaces. Unfortunately, the, the technical details are quite technical, but the basic idea is extremely simple. Let me, you know, give you it. So we all know there is at least one example that we all know are aware of about an inequality that makes a self-improvement like this one, which is Cauchy's bus. Let's look at Cauchy's bus. Take an RD on a Riemannian manifold or a metric measure space, whatever you want. So if you suppose that you know, and as you in fact actually do, that for any function f, the f, scalpel of the f is non-negative. Now pick as capital F, pick now pick two smooth functions or double functions or whatever you want, fix them, f and g, and write in place of capital F, write it, you know, f plus h g, which h is test. Write that inequality, optimize in h, and what you get is this, which is a kind of a self-improvement of this inequality, because now the f, the f is not only non-negative, but it's greater than something which is typically strictly positive. Huh? This divided by, you know, dg, dg squared. And in some sense, in some sense, the same sort of trick, a little bit more, you know, complicated, but conceptual is really this. You, you, you write the, the book inequality without this term, not for F, but for a polynomial of F in terms of other functions, then you optimize. And if you're brave enough, and certainly Buckley Bach, has, uh, has been so brave, you can, you can uh, you know, start getting positive terms or the negative terms on the right-hand side. And if you perform things properly, and this, I think, has been done by myself and Sturm independently, then, then you can reach, then you can reach the full uh, Hessian term on the right hand side. So, just to make a long story short, where does this bring? If you, you know, if you, if we start from this definition of RCD space that I just uh, uh, gave you, and with the self improvement of the local inequality, well, first of all, the fact that that you have an Hessian term on the right hand side, and if you remember, on the right hand side, you know, Hessian squared plus Ricci is less to equal than something, right? So that, that is what the book and is telling. Hessian squared less to equal than something, it means that, you know, at least conceptually, there is, there is room to speak about W2 or H22 functions. So functions which have an Hessian actually in L2. Now, Hessian, of course, is something that with proper definition requires a little bit of work, but basically it's, uh, um, uh, you know, the space where the Hessian lives is nothing but some appropriate tensor product of this cotangent module with itself. I mean, there is a little bit of algebra involved, uh, but, but nothing too deep. What is deeper is the fact that you can use that sort of algebraic manipulations to produce a notion of Hessian in L2, defined through integration by parts and the book inequality. Now, if you have a function with an Hessian in L2, it means that its gradient has covariant derivative in L2, that sort of the same way, the same thing. Uh, and, and so, so in, in this setting of RCD spaces, not only you have, you know, vector fields, but you can speak about sobered vector fields having covariant derivative in L2. And in a very natural way, this covariant derivative is compatible with the metric and torsion free. You can perform in some sense, uh, you know, you can, you can work uh, definition of exterior differentiation at, in the space of, you know, um, uh, K-forms. Uh, and uh, so you can de develop the RAP cohomology and Dodge theory. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and once you have done all of this, you can pick the Bokren identity that I brought a couple of slides ago. Actually, you can prove it, you can write it in the better formalism, not for gradient vector fields, but for general vector fields. So in the smooth setting, this is basically an identity. And in the not smooth setting, once again, those lines above give a definition, or at least and I'm telling you that they give a definition of these terms in the right hand side, and I can use this to define a rich curvature, rich curvature tensor. That, of course, luckily, is bounded from below by k, as it should be. Okay, and this and this and, and this a tensor in a very natural way. Now, let me mention perhaps that this sort of construction uh, admits uh, generalization. In particular, Matthias has worked uh, 
you know, the, the delicate details of uh, adaptation and, you know, finding a way of handling this, this sort of um, low regularity uh, calculus to settings more general RCD K infinity spaces. So spaces where uh, the lower bound of the Ricci curve are just interpreted in a Cato sense, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, so, but the rebounds from below are not unique. All right. Um, now, um, um, perhaps let me tell you something that you can do with this tensor calculus. You can study perturbations of metric measure structures. So there are, there are many geometric constructions where you start, uh, say, with the Riemannian manifold, you perturb the distance, the measure, something like this. And because you perturb uh, the, the, the metric in a certain way, the curvature has also been perturbed in a certain way. Typically, when you perform this, this sort of you know, geometric uh, modification in the non-smooth category, uh, things are complicated. Uh, you know, understanding how the structure changes is complicated typically by the lack, by the lack of, uh, of uh, tensor calculus. So in particular, if your interpretation of curvature is only by means of geodesics uh, or you know, vast and geodesic or something like this, uh, typically this is information that is totally destroyed by, by uh, even simple transformation of the metric measure structures. And a series of results by Anne, Mikchan, and Sturm basically tell you that, okay, short, long story short, okay, now here I made a very simple uh, example of transformation as basically uh, just a transformation of the level of measure, but you know, there are more complicated transformations like conformal transformations where, where in some sense the same kind of of bounds that you could deduce on a transformed space in the smooth category can be also can be also you know uh, uh, deduced in non-smooth category under suitable but natural uh, assumptions on on uh, you know how you how you, you know, transform uh, which sort of transformation you consider. Now I mentioned this because these results are are the first one uh, of a general flavor if you, 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 you exclude uh, uh, trivial uh, considerations. Or, or easier considerations like, you know, uh, taking product of spaces like something like that, where you start from a non-smooth structure, you perform geometric operations, perturbing it, and you see that the resulting structure has the same kind of non-smoothness. So it was RCD at the beginning, still is RCD in the end, maybe with different coefficients, but it's still in the same category. And it is interesting, I'm, I'm pointing this out because in the, in the case of Alexandro spaces, which is in a sense the sister theory where lower Ricci is replaced by lower sectional closure bound, the same sort of program has not been carried out. And in fact, carrying it out is at least one of the, you know, uh, one of the um, most important questions in Alexandro geometry. Let me give you an explicit example. Take, uh, and so think in the smooth category, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing not smooth over here. If you take a smooth Riemannian manifold with no negative sectional curvature, and if you take a function which is smooth and convex, and you look at the graph of this function inside the product of m cross r, then certainly this graph inherits uh, the structure, the Riemannian structure, and you can wonder what its curvature is. And in fact, in fact, what you can prove is not hard to prove. The, the sectional curvature of, of the graph is also non negative. And how can you prove it? Well, you run the computation. There's a formula, it's called the Gauss formula, I guess one of the 100 formula by Gauss, uh, uh, that tells you how, what is the curvature of the new manifold in terms of the curvature of the new manifold and the action of the function. And things have the correct sign in some sense. Okay. Now, if you know what an Alexandro space is, you can recon with lower section of curvature bound, you may recognize that the statement of this theorem, uh, you know, can be done even in the Nosmos category. Right? So I can wonder whether this has non-smooth counterpart, but nobody knows. Okay? And basically nobody knows. And I think, so I would say that one of the reasons why nobody knows is basically the only proof known of this theorem passes through computations. And an actual sectional curvature uh, tensor is not available as of today in the Alexandro setting. Okay, so, so, and if you try to look at triangle comparison, you look at the shape of triangles, on, on graphs, uh, it's, it's hard to get control on, on this, okay? Um, so perhaps, uh, so what I wanted to advertise and I'm almost done is that, so 
I'm making a long story short, but these Alexandro spaces is that this space will lower section of curvature bound if finite dimensional fall in the category of RCD spaces. So, so maybe we can use this calculus on RCD spaces to perhaps take, if not take, or at least get some insight about the uh, problems of this form and understanding how to develop a, a you know a distributional calculus on Alexandro spaces. And in fact, uh, what one can do so. So is, is not only, so I just said a couple of slides ago that you can define a rich equivalent tensor, but in fact, you can define a sort of a distribution of Riemann tensor on RCD space. So the full, you know, full four Riemann, you know, four entries uh, Riemann tensor. And, and why you can do so? Well, because if you think about how you define the Riemann tensor on, on the smooth manifold, the typical term in the definition of Riemann tensor has this shape over here. So grad X of Y, grad X, grad Y, Z, scalar plus W. But if you multiply this object by a smooth function f and you integrate by parts, basically you can throw one derivative that is sitting on z on either w or on the vector x that was being used to differentiate. And the interesting thing about, about, about this expression is that, is that on the right-hand side, only first of the derivatives of vector fields are taken. And these are things that have a precise meaning on the RCD setting. So we can use it to this right-hand side to give a distributional meaning to that term on the Riemann tensor. And then you add the others and you get, uh, and you get the full Riemann. And, uh, and so perhaps, and I conclude with this slide, um, one can wonder whether, whether, whether I can recognize an n-dimensional Alexandro space by looking uh, at the sectional curvature tensor, basically in this distributional uh, setting on uh, uh, the metric measure space that results if I equip the metric space XD Alexandro with its uh, n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. Uh, so in such what we know from Petrunin and Zhang and Zhu is that if one holds, then this space is RCD KN minus 1N, meaning uh, there is the expected compatibility with the lower section and lower reach bounds on the non smooth setting, but perhaps, perhaps, Perhaps uh, this lower section of bound intend, intended in the sense of triangle comparisons, maybe, maybe, hopefully, or I mean, maybe it's related to this section of curvature tensor. And I think, I think that, you know, understanding, so this conjecture, I think, from my perspective, it's interesting, even if false, because if it's false, it points to a clear limit uh, of the, you know, the sober calculus and distributional calculus and veracity setting, and perhaps understanding its limits helps us further understanding you know what to do next in order to uh, developing in order to develop a more precise calculus okay and that's all i wanted to see thank you for the attention